Hi, I'm Bob Stern. I'm Taras Giria. And we're very pleased to participate in this session, Unconventional Ideas and Outrageous Hypotheses, in honor of Warren B. Hamilton. In this talk, entitled The Plate Tectonic Pump, How the Transition from Single Lead to Plate Tectonics Stimulates Biological Evolution, we explore how changes in Earth's tectonic regime are likely to have affected biological evolution. It is appropriate to do this in a session honoring Warren Hamilton's career. Warren was one of my heroes as an undergraduate at the University of California at Davis in the early 1970s, where I read and reread the paper Mesozoic California and the Underflow of Pacific Mantle. In this paper, Warren explores how the fundamental plate tectonic processes that a year later would be called subduction shaped California in the Mesozoic. Warren continued to contribute to our science well into his 90s, giving all of us hope that we could live that long and stay so sharp. Our interests aligned again in the last 15 years of his life as we both wrote about when plate tectonics began and what was Earth's tectonic regime before that important transition. I was very excited when he wrote in a 2013 email, I have no comprehension of how plate tectonics began, except that I vaguely perceive it as a fuzzy transition from about 1 billion years ago to about 600 million years ago, at the end of which plate tectonics burst forth in its full splendor. In the rest of this talk, we will explore some implications of the fuzzy transition for the evolution of life. We know that Earth's life and tectonics influence each other. Life on Earth began sometime before 3.8 billion years ago, but we are more uncertain about when plate tectonics began. Estimates range from the Hadean to the Neoproterozoic. Because 70% of the estimates for when plate tectonics began are younger than 3.8 billion years ago, and because we agree with Warren Hamilton that plate tectonics began in Neoproterozoic time, we will assume that the fuzzy transition occurred after life began. We focus not on what that fuzzy transition was, but on how it accelerated life evolution. What was Earth's tectonic style before plate tectonics started? It was almost certainly some kind of stagnant lid tectonics. This is an unfortunate term because the term stagnation implies that nothing is happening. Think of a stagnant career or a stagnant economy or a stagnant relationship. But that's not true for tectonically active silicate bodies with stagnant lid tectonics. Sure, some silicate bodies with stagnant lid tectonics can be tectonically dead, like the Moon or Mercury, but others are very active, like Venus. We think it is better to use a more generic term, single lid tectonics, that includes both rigid, non-deformable lid and squishy, tectonomagmatically active lid. There are five tectonically active silicate bodies in our solar system, and four of them have tectonomagmatic regimes that can usefully be called single lid, but their styles all differ. Io has the most active volcanoes and rapid magmatic resurfacing. Venus is vigorously erupting and deforming with a squishy single lid. And Mars has a very sluggish single lid style. Earth before three billion years ago almost certainly had a squishy lid tectonic style similar to Venus. After that, Earth may have experienced a long transition from squishy lid to modern style plate tectonics and may have had multiple styles of active single lid behavior. Kent Condy will talk tomorrow about the sluggish mesoproterozoic single lid magmatotectonic style. What difference does tectonic style make for the evolution of life? First, we need to think about how evolution happens. We can see from the history of life on Earth that this occurred in three stages, 
each taking different amounts of time and happening in different environments. First, 80% of the 3.8 billion years it took for complex life to evolve was consumed by starting life and evolving increasingly complex single-celled and colonial organisms like stromatolites. Stage one also led to an oxygen-rich environment essential for the evolution of larger, more complex animals. Stage one evolution happened at different depths in the ocean, first around deep sea hydrothermal vents and then in the shallow photic zone once photosynthesis evolved. Next, stage two, involving about 10% of evolution time, witnessed the development of multicellular plants and animals, including fish with backbones and limbs. Because photosynthetic plants were the base of the food chain, this stage mostly happened in the shallow water of the continental shelves. Finally, stage three, involving 10% of evolution time, witnessed colonization of land by plants and air-breathing animals. As we understand it, evolution of complex organisms requires oceans, continental shelves, and continents. With this perspective in mind, we now need to discuss how the tectonic style of active silicate bodies will affect these stages. Once life begins on an active planetoid with continents and oceans, evolution on a single lid body will proceed more slowly than on a similar body with plate tectonics. This point was addressed 50 years ago in a seminal paper by Jim Valentine and Eldridge Moores. They argued that the diversity of invertebrate marine life which flourishes on continental shelves, increased when the continents and their shelves were fragmented, for example, in Ordovician through Carboniferous or in Cenozoic time. This was because continental breakup separated continental shelves, providing the isolation needed to evolve new species. In contrast, when the continental fragments recombined in Permo-Triassic time into a supercontinent surrounded by a single continuous continental shelf, there was less diversity in evolution. A recent paper by Zaffos et al. confirmed the findings of Valentine and Moores. From these results, we can extrapolate that evolution on a single lid bodies with otherwise identical distribution of oceans and continents will proceed more slowly than for bodies with plate tectonics. The single lid body cannot easily isolate environments needed for evolving new species in the same way that a body with plate tectonics can. A simple thought experiment for two such bodies shows this. The panels on the right are for the body with plate tectonics and the ones on the left are for the single lid body. Both bodies start off with one type of plant, one type of herbivore, and one type of carnivore. Both bodies are similarly affected by meteorite impacts and mantle plumes, both of which can cause extinctions and thus drive evolution. But the plate tectonic planet has a way of isolating continents and continental shelves, whereas the stagnant lid body does not. Over the approximately 500 million years of a supercontinent cycle, rift and drift associated with supercontinent breakup allows the isolation needed for new species to evolve and recombination causes organisms occupying the same ecological niche to compete. The end result is that evolution will happen faster on a body with plate tectonics than it will on a stagnant lid body. The role of plate tectonic isolation and recombination for accelerating evolution may not be as important for stage one evolution as it is for stages two and three. Single-celled organisms are more difficult to isolate by plate tectonic processes because they are easily moved by water currents. In contrast, multicelled organisms are harder to move by currents and can be isolated by continental drift. It is still controversial when plate tectonics began on Earth, but all parties to the controversy agree that plate tectonics was happening during stages two and three on Earth. There are other reasons why evolution is enhanced by plate tectonics and inhibited by single lid tectonics. One reason is that Earth's climate is buffered over long timescales 
by a negative feedback between atmospheric carbon dioxide and surface temperature. Mantle degassing as a result of igneous activity and metamorphism constantly adds CO2 to the atmosphere, and the greenhouse effect this produces over time would result in a climate inhospitable to life unless there is a way to remove this greenhouse gas. Weathering, which removes atmospheric CO2, increases when the climate is warm, leading to a weaker greenhouse effect and cooling surface temperatures. When surface temperatures are cooler, weathering is reduced, allowing mantle-derived CO2 to build up in the atmosphere, leading to a stronger greenhouse and warmer climate. Key for this negative feedback loop is a constant supply of fresh rock for weathering. Plate tectonics supplies this in abundance via basaltic lavas associated with hot spots and rifting. Lavas and ash from arc volcanoes and crust exposed by continental collision and rift-related uplift. Single-lid planets are less capable of generating weatherable rock and so are more likely to have climates that are inhospitably warm for life. Nutrient supply is also important for life and evolution. Life requires a long list of elements such as carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, iron, and many other trace elements that are contained in rocks. These elements cycle between life on Earth's surface and the mantle as a result of plate tectonics, especially via outgassing and volcanism and by weathering of rocks. These interactions between tectonics and life are the focus of a new interdisciplinary research field called biogeodynamics. We are beginning to understand biogeodynamic interactions associated with plate tectonics on Earth, but have not even begun to explore how biogeodynamics would occur on active single-lid planets. It does seem likely that the supply of nutrients to the biosphere is stronger with plate tectonics than without. Let's put all these ingredients together to think about what is likely to happen on a planet with life when its tectonic regime changes from single lid to plate tectonics. For the reasons articulated previously, evolution is likely to be slow during single lid episodes because plate tectonics easily causes isolation and recombination, moderates climate, and enhances nutrient supply, evolution is likely to accelerate with a transition to plate tectonics. Let me repeat this key conclusion. Evolution rates on a planet with life will be slow when it has a single lid tectonic style and will accelerate when it has a plate tectonic style. Of course, there is much that we don't know about how planetary tectonic style is likely to affect rates of biological evolution. For example, what are the effects of changing tectonic style for stage one evolution compared to stage two or three? For now, it may be enough to consider that this is a very promising line of future research where biologists and geoscientists can work together. Cross-disciplinary work is needed to assemble and analyze critical observational data, as well as to develop new hybrid numerical biogeodynamical modeling tools coupling geodynamic process to evolution of atmosphere, oceans, climate, and life. One last point worth considering is what these conclusions mean for the search for extraterrestrial life. Technological species, defined as those capable of radio communications, are more likely to evolve on a silicate planet with plate tectonics than on a single lid planet. When we are able to infer the presence of life in the tectonic regime of habitable exoplanets, it may be better to colonize the single-lid planets with life than the plate tectonic planets. We are more likely to repeat the bad behaviors associated with colonizing the New World and Africa during the past few hundred years here on Earth on plate tectonic exoplanets than on single-lid exoplanets. Thank you for listening.